Welcome to Arash's World. Today we have a very special guest, uh, Sean Thompson. Welcome to Arash's World. Uh, Arash, it's great to be on. Great. Uh, and um, how are we doing today? Good. Everything's good. I'm uh, coming to you from Santa Barbara in California. Nice. As you can hear by my accent, I'm not a born American. Uh, I've lived in this area now for about 25 years. So Great. And so one of the questions I like to ask uh, uh, all the uh, guests here is, how would you describe yourself? And I'm very curious to see how you would briefly do that. <laughs> how to describe myself? Well, firstly, I think one word that really describes me is stoked. And yes, it's okay. a certain term, but it also, I think, is descriptive of this internal fire that drives us forward. So I'm a very uh, driven person. I'm a very stoked person. Uh, and also, um, I think I'm a lifelong learner as well, so I'm very curious. That's wonderful. And as, I love to hear that as, a, as an educator myself and a lifelong seeker and learner as well. I can definitely resonate with this. But uh, you are a world champion uh, surfer. You are also an author, and we're going to talk about your book, which sounds fascinating, The Surfer and the Sage, A Guide to Survive and Ride life's waves but you also have your business enterprise and uh if my information is correct you are also an ex calvin klein model briefly ah, is that okay ah, ah, ah. where did you find that <laughs> <laughs> that's just fascinating so um i don't know where did you start there's so much stuff here <laughs> so, so yeah let's let's talk about your book and, and again cool. at some point if you like, we can get into the modeling bit. But um, yeah, the, the surf and the sage. So uh, looking at surfing in terms of philosophy of, uh, of dealing with life, of dealing with the ups and downs, and often the downs there, there are, they are pretty terrible. And we've experienced it a uh, whole scale here uh, in the world with the pandemic. And so um, first, uh, what inspired you to, to write this book? Well, surfing is very rich um, experientially, and also I think from a philosophical and cultural aspect, um, it's a beautiful metaphor. And most of the people that use surfing metaphors um, know nothing about surfing at all. Mm -hmm. you know, you'll have these big keynote speakers and you'll have these authors and philosophers and they've never experienced surfing. Yeah. So they come at it from a completely um, like a vicarious experience angle and from a very, um, I think, ill-informed angle. You know, Perhaps people... also, sorry, idealistic as well, because we have an image that does not necessarily go with the reality then. We just have this notion. And I, again, I, I don't know much about it, but I like the metaphor. <laughs> yeah, and that's a great metaphor, you know, waves of change and mm -hmm. um, sea change mm -hmm. and... Uh, um, the power of riptides, uh, the impact zone, you know, all these um, sort of different experiences um, that we as service experience on, on a daily basis that are wonderful metaphors for the turbulence trouble um, that all of us have to deal with in life. So um, many years ago, well, not that long ago, in 2006, um, on the 24th of April, my wife and I lost our beautiful son, Luke. Yeah. Oh, son, sorry. Matthew. Matthew Very sorry to hear that. Our first son, yeah. So it was a, a terrible time for us. At that stage, uh, my wife and I had a company called Solitude. We were working in the apparel business. Um, and the company had just been sold. We'd sold, we'd, sold, we'd sold the company to a publicly traded company, a very large, a multi-billion dollar company. Um, and uh, we were going to stay on for a few more years, you know, and, and, and um, that was sort of going to be our, our path. And when we lost our son, everything changed. And mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people, you know, have to deal with grief and suffering. And that's one of the most terrible things that can happen to a parent is, is the loss of a child. So uh, we both fundamentally reevaluated our lives. I evaluated my life path. Um, I actually had a book at the printer at the time my first book called Surface Code, 12 Simple Lessons for Riding Through Life. Mm -hmm. uh, also, it was a book about spirituality and philosophy using uh, the, the lessons that surfing had taught me um, about life. And I put the book on hold 
while I kind of decided what I was going to do and what the next step was. And then I realized I must bring the book out because the book was um, a way to memorialize and honor, honor our beautiful son. He was 15 and a half. He died playing this ter terrible game that he heard about at school called the choking game. All the kids at his school wore school ties. They wore a uniform. And the game had been going around the school. And, and this terrible game does go around schools, unfortunately, and through emotional contagion, kids get involved with this. Um, and it can have fatal consequences. And unfortunately, you know, we lost our beautiful boy. So I just kind of reevaluated where I was going and what I was doing. And um, the book came out. And then I started speaking to people. People would invite me to speak at conferences schools, universities, community groups, religious groups. Um, and I found that that speaking was really great in a number of ways. Firstly, by helping others and giving others a perspective, it really helped me. Um, and then I discovered that this method uh, that I spoke about in the book was incredibly transformational for other people. And it was a way for people to find uh, and define and refine their purpose. And I came to the conclusion that, that, that it's a really simple process. Uh, find your purpose, find your power, and find your path. Mm -hmm. uh, and the book was built around this code that I'd written for young people that were coming down to the beach to inspire them about an environmental problem with this very, very famous surfing break. And I wrote 12 lines, every line beginning with our will. And they were all metaphors, every single line, and they were all about surfing. I will always paddle back out. Mm -hmm. So obviously that refers to resilience and perseverance. Um, I will never turn my back on the ocean. Okay. That can refer to obviously being aware of dangers in the world, but still not turning your back and not being a coward and not running away, facing... Um, issues head on. And also it refers to that when you have this wonderful love and passion um, to stick with it. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I was really reminded of my father, who was one of South Africa's top swimmers and was going to the Olympics and was very badly attacked by a shark, nearly killed him. But he never lost this amazing love that he, that he had for the, um, for the beach. And then there was other lines. I will realize that all surfers are joined by one ocean. This notion mm -hmm. of engagement, empathy, connectivity. Um, and then when the book came out and I started traveling around um, and speaking in very large groups with very famous people like Malcolm Gladwell and Richard Branson and mm -hmm. speaking at very famous companies like Google and Cisco and Gap and General Motors and just big, big companies, um, I came to the realization that with this little code that I was telling people about, there, there was great power in the simplicity and purity of this and I was invited to speak a little school in here in Santa Barbara it was only 80 students and I met the headmaster in, in while I was surfing um, in the water at the break that originally had the environmental problem where I created this little card uh, with the 12 lines on it that I gave to the kids to inspire them to empower them to take action about this environmental problem and ultimately we solved the problem but then we started printing more and more of these cards and we put the cards in our pockets of our board shorts and clothing and hundreds of thousands of these cards were getting distributed out into the into the universe and then it led to my first book surface code so now the book has come out and i'm talking at these events and then i go and see this little school in santa barbara and i say to the kids there's only 80 kids two little small 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 uh, old farmhouses i say you know surface code and the book it's my code. I wrote it. I wrote it in about 15 or 20 minutes, 12 lines. Mm -hmm. Every line begins with our will. It's about commitment. It's about focus. Um, it's about purpose. I said, what about your code? What about all of you writing your code? 12 lines. Oh, very good question. Line beginning with our will. Yeah. I write it in 15 or 20 minutes and send it to me. It's 80 kids, 12 lines. That's nearly a thousand lines of code that they sent me. And the very first line of code I got from a young girl, her name was Elena Alcera, she was 13 at the time, was I will always be myself. Oh, that's wonderful. 
So it was amazing, especially in the context of what had happened to my son. And my son played this game because he heard about it at school. And we didn't know whether it was victimization, a peer pressure thing, bullying. We'll, we'll never know. But he found out about it from someone. And then he acted on it. Mm -hmm. He shouldn't have. He should have had this power to think twice. But um, he did it. And these words really spoke to me. So I got so stoked and so inspired by the words. And then the amazing words of the other kids. I will not do what others expect me to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, just other beautiful words. I will have faith. I'll pray. So I immediately phoned up my co-author, Patrick Bowes, who was a professor of French literature. And I said, hey, Patrick, we're going to write another book. And this book's going to be called The Code, The Power of I Will. And this book is going to be a framework for positive decision making to encourage kids to write the code and to focus on positive decision making. So um, the book came out and, and became popular. And then I incorporated this program into all my talks for schools, for universities, for the largest companies in the world. And everyone, I would do my presentation, everyone would write the code, 12 lines. Every line begins with our world. So I incorporated into my presentations. And then when COVID hit, I could no longer do my presentation. So I started doing my presentations virtually. Mm -hmm. So I would go out to thousands, tens of thousands of people, virtually some of the hottest companies in the world at that time, Gilead Sciences, who at the time had the only treatment for COVID in the entire world, on the, in, in the entire planet, there was one company. Mm -hmm. So they were on the front pages of all the newspapers. So these companies would phone me when they were having issues with their teams, keeping their teams together. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to find unique ways of re-engaging their teams with each other and with the fundamental purpose of the organization. So I thought, wow, it's going to be really interesting to find out how people are feeling yeah. during this period. Yeah. Because generally, as a speaker, it's one-way traffic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You speak, and I always say I give a perspective, I don't give a prescription. I tell some stories, I tell about development and application of the code and then everyone writes their code and then there's a certain interactivity when people write their code everyone else can see the code and they'll send me lines of their code but I never asked until COVID I never, had never asked people how they feel mm -hmm. then so I started my presentations and it was kind of a little bit clunky at first send me one word it describes how you're feeling. I just want one right now. Send me one word. And the words, thousands of them would pile in to my PowerPoint and then it would form a word cloud. So mm -hmm. in a word cloud, it's a whole jumble of words, but the more frequent words are larger. So at a glance, I could see the mindset of that company or that school or that university or that rehab clinic or that group of PTSD survivors or that jail. So through COVID, I did, I don't know, maybe 50, 100,000 people, a massive, massive amount of people. So I read a lot of words. And the words were stress, yeah. anxiety, yeah. depression, disconnection. I called it a sad mindset. Mm -hmm. So that was the start point of my presentations. So Noah Ben Shia, my co-author and I, had met and we decided to write a book together within five minutes. We went to a restaurant, had lunch, we'd never met each other, and we just bonded immediately, we connected, and uh, within five minutes he said to me, hey Sean, let's write a book together. Mm -hmm. And I went, cool, we're going to call it The Surfer and the Sage. That's wonderful. You can see Noah Ben Shea like is a superstar himself as, as yeah. his agent. You're the surfer and combining your forces there. Oh, I just love that. <laughs> he's like a Pulitzer nominated uh, writer, poet, mm -hmm. uh, philosopher. So within five minutes, we had a title. And then he said, okay, a guide to survive and ride life's waves. To survive mm -hmm. and ride life's waves. 
So then we were sort of tooling around like structure because, you know, it's two people. We don't really know each other. How are we going to write it together? Are we going to have two voices, one voice? What, 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 we, what are we going to do? So I said to me, no, I've been doing these events, these big events, and this is how people are feeling. Mm -hmm. Stress, anxiety, yeah. Yeah. depression, disconnection. I think we should write into this problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what we decided to do, we decided to confront this problem head on. Mm -hmm. So every chapter of the book is about the duality of life. It's not about optimism, hope, mm -hmm. positivity. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. But it's also about the dark side. So every chapter has the darkness before the light, anxious and calm. That's the very, 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 very first chapter. Despair and hope, okay. doubt and faith. So the whole book is almost like a guide to take a journey from the darkness mm -hmm. to the light. I really like that. It uh, it kind of uh, the the dark side. I think that many people are not looking at it. Many people are not facing it. Many people are not facing their fears. And 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 you have done that throughout your life as well. And and I have uh, I have done that now. Instead of avoiding the problems, like as you're saying, head on experiencing them. And to me, it kind of reminds me also of uh, uh, Eric Erickson, where you have those two options, basically, through the different phases of your life. You know, you can have stagnation or you can progress and so on, develop. And um, I, I think that's quite fascinating um, because as you're mentioning codes earlier, I think we all have codes, but often it's it's like we don't realize our codes. They're kind of unconscious. And when you make that commitment of I will and you're like voicing it and saying it out loud, it creates a certain kind of bond and contract with yourself. And I think that's wonderful. And to also recognize, though, that's hugely important, to recognize the, the darker aspects and say, yes, this is me as well. You know, I'm not shunning it. I'm not like a, a saint or a holy person, but I can turn into the light. I can step into the light uh, step by step. Again, that's like doesn't happen overnight. So I, I really like this approach. I, I, I very much, uh, it's not just, because a lot of inspirational books are also like a positive thinking and you should think this and so on. It's like, uh, no, that's not helping because we have to address the, the elephant in the room, the dark elephant that, that yeah. we all carry around with us. But you know, you, you are right. These are 12 promises that you make to yourself. Mm -hmm. It's a covenant. Yes. You write your code, it's like a covenant. And what happens is when you <clears throat> write the code publicly, mm -hmm. when you publish it publicly, yeah. it creates enormous accountability. Yeah. Pressure as well, but good kind of pressure. But good, because yeah. you, you have made this statement, mm -hmm. I will be a better team player, or I will be a better father, mm -hmm. or I will forgive myself. I, I did this one event at the Santa Barbara County Jail. They got about 900 prisoners up there. I did this one group called the 300 Club. They're all tough guys. They <laughs> think they're like Spartans. And um, I had them all write their codes. And then one at, a, one at a time, they stood up and they read their codes to the entire audience. One at a time, everyone. Mm -hmm. It was very emotional experience, very accountability, and also deep interpersonal engagement. And the one inmate came to alone, I'll forgive myself. Now that in the context of that person's personal experience, he's obviously committed some sort of offense and he's now behind bars and he's having to reevaluate his life. But the first step, um, and it's like when you're grieving as well, you know, you've got to forgive mm -hmm. absolutely unconditionally. Mm -hmm. There's no blame. Um, and this guy said, I'll forgive myself. And he started crying. And then what do you think all the other prisoners did? The other inmates? What do you think they did? The same. Yeah. They started crying yeah. and they all came around him and they hugged him yeah. and they supported him. Mm -hmm. So this code process, I've got the super cool tech now when everyone writes their code, everyone else can see what everyone else has written. You've got your code, you've got a picture there. And, and you can create your own code. So 
in the context of that group, you have this deep interpersonal engagement. The code process is very, very vulnerable because you are writing who you are from the inside out. I mean, you are writing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from the, I mean, if you, if you, if you're writing, honestly, you are writing your spirit down, you're writing your commitment, you're writing down who you are and who you will be. Mm -hmm. So it's a very profound little, um, it's a little exercise. You know, psychologists, you know, they call that they call what I do an intervention. Mm -hmm. A big university studied my method here, and, and the dean said to me, hey, Sean, this is the most transformational intervention we have ever studied. It's a very, very famous mm. psychology university. So it sounds so simple, and it sounds so juvenile. And it is simple, and it is juvenile. And in that simplicity of structure, and in that naivete, we can really formulate a new path forward and we can find our best selves, like the very yeah. best part of ourselves. When someone says, I will pray, or I will be the best father I can be, or I will be a lifelong learner, or I will lift up people when they are down, or I will mentor, or I will volunteer. It's just, it's just beautiful. And it's beautiful for me to just be there to light a spark. Mm -hmm. I didn't show the way. Mm -hmm. I didn't show which road to travel on. I didn't offer a prescription. I just offer a perspective. Through my perspective, it's like a window. Outwards, people can look at their life perhaps differently through that perspective. And also, it's kind of like a mirror. They can look at themselves deeply, especially when they write their code. And then I offer the tool. So I offer just two things, perspective and a and a tool. Um, and now I've got the system where people can write their codes. And I've just developed this new tech, which is super cool. Um, so I, I launched my book on a very big show called the Today Show a few days ago. Oh, cool. uh, the Today Show on NBC. Mm -hmm. So, so what, what, what we did for the show is we've created this method because I want every single person on this planet to write their code. Every single person on this planet, I think that the world and shared with their tribe, I think the world will be a better place. Mm -hmm. And hopefully they can share it with other tribes too. So for instance, you Arash, if you go, okay, I'm gonna set up a tribe. I'm gonna set up the, how do you pronounce your last name? Farzana. Farzana, yeah. Farzana. Yeah. I'm gonna set up Farzana. Anyone who's a Farzana can come in there, they can write the code. I'm setting up the tribe and I'm going to set up invites. And those people, if they want to set up their tribe, they can set up their tribe too. So we can have all these like amazing tribes with this positive experience. Yes, we're cognizant that there is darkness in the world, but we can create these tribes. And these tribes can be a bridge between the division that we have in humanity at the moment. In the United States, You've got the Republicans on one side of the valley, and you've got the Democrats on the other side of the valley. And in between, it's uncharted territory that people don't know how to cross. Yeah. And I think the code is a way yeah. to cross that chasm. Um, and the code for athletes, it's a way to cross the chasm between victory and defeat, yeah. which is a one millimeter chasm. But let me tell you, that is a massively wide one millimeter. So the code has got, it's got so many different uses. I like to think it's like a, uh, it's like a Swiss army knife for mindset. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a Swiss army knife to change a mindset. It's just, you know, you can do it so easy, so simply. It's free. Uh -huh. And listen to this one, Arash. Yeah. It's open source code. Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> and, and, and you're absolutely right. Research in psychology shows that. So a lot of institutions, uh, education institutions, have the the honor code. So you you sign and say, "I'm not going to plagiarize," and it's uh, and cheat, and it actually works. It does reduce it because of that commitment, that like psychological commitment. It's like I signed it, therefore I have to abide by it. But a lot of people distance themselves from that because, like, oh, it's not really me. But when you have a code with yourself that's yeah. intimate, that is representing your values. And I think in many cases, as, as you're saying, absolutely, 
we have very similar values. Everybody yeah. has the same values. We just uh, don't realize it. And Absolutely that's happening right. in terms of politics where they see each other's enemies. Absolutely. But I'm thinking you guys have so much in common if you really like dig deep and, and look at it. Yeah. So, you know, code is a list of values. That's what mm -hmm. it is, mm -hmm. essentially. The code is a list of values. So adding our will to it just gives it another dimension and it, and it makes it um, purposeful. So, so psychologists define purpose as this committed intent to accomplish aims that are meaningful to self and the broader world. Committed intent. So they talk about purpose, but like how to find purpose. I'm saying the code is a simple way to find your purpose, a super yes. simple way to find your purpose. And also there's been massive amounts of psychological uh, research mm -hmm. on aims, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. not on aims, on goals, not so oh, much yeah. on aims, which are broader and bigger, yeah. but yeah. there's been a lot with Locke and Latham and mm -hmm. self-determination theory. And I mean, here, yeah, look at this. Mm -hmm. Manageable goals, you know. New developments and goal setting, setting and yeah. past performance. And you know, they talk about smart goals, specific, mm -hmm. measurable, mm -hmm. achievable, relevant, time sensitive. And I'm going, the code and purpose is different. I like to think purpose, aim at, that's my acronym. Mm -hmm. Purpose is aspirational, purpose is inspirational, mm -hmm. purpose, is, purpose is moral, mm -hmm. purpose is authentic. And purpose is timeless. It's not time sensitive. Yeah. Your purpose is like your values. Your yeah. values are not going to change next year. Yeah. You're still going to yeah. have morality, integrity, honor, empathy. You know, the, the, the yeah. basic value is not going, to, not going to change. And people reveal their value structure when they write the code. And also, when people write their code, they write the meaning of life. Yeah. And, you know, philosophers, you know, Socrates, Plato, exactly. Uh, I was thinking all, of the ancient Greeks. Well, as you're all, talking, yeah. I'm thinking of Aristotle and all those. Yeah. Totally. yeah. You know, and then to the Romans, Cicero, Virgil. Yeah. They've all grappled with like, what's the meaning of life? You can read yeah. Victor Frankl, you know, he talks about man's search yeah. for meaning. So when I read these codes, and I've read over a million lines, maybe millions, I don't know, just everyone writes different lines, but they only write two lines. So the meaning of life can be defined in the context of two lines of code. One is, I will be better. Mm -hmm. We have this fundamental genetic compulsion. We just want to be better. We mm -hmm. want to be better today than we were yesterday. We want to be better tomorrow than we were. You know, we, we just want to be better. We want to learn more. We want to be more successful. You know, we just, we're driven. Yeah. Humans are driven. And the other line is, I will help others be better. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yes. So every, every line... You, you really need the second line, too, because what, yeah. what happens with those codes, often we are comparing with others, and my code is better than your code, and that kind of competition uh, will work well in terms of uh, when you're in sports, because you want to be better than the other yeah. person, but we should focus on ourselves and what we can do to help others. I like the second point, because that really, like, the altruistic side of it comes out and should be because that's that's what we're here for that's the meaning and 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 everything has meaning and we just have to to find it and connect with it i think and um uh, david kessler wrote a book about uh, grief and he's, he added the the sixth stage which was uh, um, finding meaning and uh and, and some things you know we 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 have to search for it and the, the metaphor that I first read about surfing um, was a, a, a meditation guru who was saying, like, you can't stop the waves, but you can learn how to surf. Yeah. And that has stuck with me ever since I read it, like in my undergrad years. And I'm thinking that is so true. And when you think of meditation is like, OK, these thoughts will be coming, but I can learn how to manage it. And the stress will be coming. The anxiety will be coming but I can deal with it. And suddenly you realize I'm mastering this like a pro. I mean, again, uh, figuratively speaking. And so I, I find that quite fascinating. The other metaphor that I liked, and I talked to a few um, uh, mountaineers uh, on my program, is this quest for rising, going up to the top of the mountain again, that kind of. So if, if we combine those two things, it's like, you know, it's, it's perfect. That's the perfect code for us. The, the, the goal, or as you're saying here, that we have to set goals, but take it really step by step.
to get there. Yeah, I think this this notion of um, um, I will is about the future and contained in those words are commitment, <clears throat> but also hope mm -hmm. because it's about something that's going to happen positively mm -hmm. um, in the future. So <clears throat> those words, you know, while they're very committed, they're also very hopeful. Um, they're very optimistic. And I think when you reveal these words to others, that's when it creates this connectivity and the realization that, you know, we way more similar than we are different, that we've got. Exactly. You know, we all have the but but he, here's here's the rub because um, we are often looking backwards and we're thinking of the past and we carry that baggage with us and it's it's always there, and uh, interestingly the part of the brain that is predicting the future or seeing the future is the same that looks at the past. So often people who are uh, suffering from depression they are not they don't seem to be able to see uh, a brighter future because it's the same part of the brain that deals with both uh, which causes this this conflict but it's important to realize that the past is already gone and there's not much we can change our attitude and uh, our feelings about it but we can't we can't change the events that happened but the future is all open and that kind of hopefulness like we really have to go ahead life affirming uh, positivity with those uh, with these goals and aims and and codes because that's what we can change the past is already gone we can only change our attitude towards which would make a big difference too when you realize i forgive myself and I, I, and once you do that it's so liberating because now that i've forgiven myself i can now go forward and um, a lot of us are stuck in the past and we don't even realize it to to the extent that we are, uh, whether it's our childhood or childhood experiences or growing up or experiences that we've had. Um, you you suffered uh, trauma, you faced a fear of sharks. Is, is that correct? So that's something that once you yeah, go I, towards I, I, it, you I can overcome it. Yeah. Yeah, I, didn't have a, I didn't have a fear of, you know, of sharks mm -hmm. you know, because of what happened to... Um, yeah to my dad but but the trauma taught me and you know the loss of, of, of my beautiful boy taught me a lot about how to deal with um how to deal with loss and suffering and and one of them one of the things that everyone has to do you know, there's all sorts of different ways that people deal with with grief but i think one of the big movements that one can have is yes, I will forgive myself. I'll forgive mm -hmm. unconditionally, mm -hmm. forgive everyone, and forgive myself. Forgive, just there's just has to be absolute forgiveness. Um, but also, um, there has to be this acceptance of what is and not what if. Yeah. So you can't think about going back and changing. What happened because you can't like no, you said the past is fixed so you have to just accept what is um, not what if it's like an athlete you know when an athlete will get into a competition and maybe he'll just miss out or just lose um, and then someone will dwell on that defeat for days and weeks and months and eventually their whole career gets into this downward spiral but you have to just stop and you have to accept um, and then you have to you have to move forward and you know when i lost my boy so I, you asked me right at the beginning of the show like you know how can i describe myself and i said one of the first words is stoked mm -hmm. stoked fire that burns mm -hmm. within me to go surfing and enthusiasm excitement exhilaration that it that it brings me so my stoke went out. I had no desire to go surfing again after I lost Matthew. Mm -hmm. So a friend of mine kept phoning me, hey, Sean, I want to take you surfing, I want to take you surfing. And I go, no, I have no interest. I said, no, I've got to take you surfing. So a few months went by. Eventually, I went, okay, I'll go surfing with you. He said, I've taken you to a break. You've never surfed before. So he took me out to this break, and it was the east coast of South Africa in Durban, my hometown. And we walked down these steps to the beach, 
And as we walked down to the water, there was no one in the water, just these beautiful little waves. The sun was rising, boiling up out of the Indian Ocean. It looked like it was boiling up, mm -hmm. coming up over the horizon. Beautiful, magnificent. These waves were beautiful. I paddled out and I was crying and the waves were just washing into me and they were washing my tears away. It was beautiful. And I was paddling out towards that sunrise. It was an amazing feeling. So I caught my first wave and I could feel my, that Matthew was with me and I caught mm -hmm. another wave and I could feel that Matthew was with me. And, and my life just started getting better right there, right then. And I paddled up to my friend. We'd been classmates at school. We'd sat next to each other at high school. And I said, hey, gee, what's the name of this wave? And, you know, surfers around the world have very descriptive names for the waves that they ride, psychos and um, super tubes. Uh, and uh, he looked over and he said, it's called Sunrise. Uh -huh. And there was, was a metaphor for the next phase of my life. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was there because it was the right time and because I looked for it. And I think when you suffer and when you go through tragedy and when we've all been through this terrible time with COVID, you've still got to look. You've still got to learn. You've got to take action. You can't dwell on this pandemic mentality. You have to look. For the sunrise mm -hmm. yeah uh, i just my just my previous podcast was about worrying and so there was this uh this idea of a worrying is just a, a waste of time and energy when you worry and uh when when you're stuck in that that frame and it's 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 really not useful because if you're worried about something my wife was always she's a nurse and she was always worried of a pandemic and it did happen so all this time she was worrying was basically just wasted energy because it, if it happens, it will happen. And then what do we do with it? And that is, and I like the as is. I was like, okay, let's face this situation. And the serenity prayer I love too, because there are certain things that are within my control that I can do and other things that I cannot do. And I just have to be okay with that are because we realize that we're not in full control. And it's like on a, on a, on a global scale again, we've realized this. Um, but we also learned that we can work together. And they, we can come up with solutions that did not exist before. We can try out new things. So that's why I think it's really important to be hopeful and uh, and uh, uh, see have a, a positive outlook because that is going to aid us. And it's it's really necessary because if we just like in, in doom and gloom and we won't do anything, we get stuck. We basically sink ourselves. And so um, I, I always say that my best learning has come through suffering. And I've... Uh, uh, the moments of intense suffering has been the, uh, I would say, probably the most fruitful, even though, again, we do not want to go through this and we don't want to seek it. But when it does happen, we just have to really realize the potential that's there. And we've seen it again with COVID, uh, where a lot of people have come out so much stronger out of this. And the other thing is that people are openly talking about those feelings of anxiety and depression, which was uh, uh, frowned upon, was a stigma. And I, I really applaud that because that is really the step in the right direction here for healing and for uh, becoming happier and better and more spiritual people. Yeah, I think really people have become a lot more open to talk about the vulnerability mm -hmm. associated with uh, um, not feeling well with, mm -hmm. with well-being sportsmen mm -hmm. you know and, and you know sports generally you know you have to have a very stoic mentality you know you can't let your competitor know that that you're going through any internal conflict or or, or any uh, or that you weak in any way and uh, but, but now you know many athletes have come out and spoken about um, personal anguish and how it impacts well-being. So well-being, as I see it, you know, in the corporate world right now, and also in the, in, in, in sort of the bigger world, is that um, big issues are well-being, personal well-being, group well-being, world well-being. Um, and when I say world well-being, I'm talking about, you know, the climate and the state of the planet. Mm -hmm. And then also engagement, you know, how we engage with our true purpose, how we engage with others, 
how we engage with um, our place in, in the world and our place in society. So those two are, are interestingly very connected, well-being and engagement, because when you engage with others, they support mm -hmm. you, they lift you mm -hmm. up, they make you feel better. Mm -hmm. When you engage with really purposeful and interesting good projects, it also lifts you up and it helps others at the same time. So there's this wonderful connectivity between well-being uh, and engagement. Mm -hmm. And it's contagious, which is the great thing because Pardon? it's contagious. Yes. We we like take it on, and it's when we're in our dark corner, we can't, we don't give it a chance. And once we are mingling with other people, whether it's virtually or in person now, uh, is uh, is so important. That kind of contact with others, and uh, of of also again focusing on the positive, because there when some some people when you talk to them, it just brings you down, and because of their negativity and just be able to to deal with that and to try to really look for for bright side especially during dark times i think yeah but i'll tell you what that, that word um contagion um you know after i um started seeing how this code was resonating how the system was resonating i thought you know i've got to learn more about the science behind it so i went back to grad school at a master of science in leadership, which is really the, uh, the art and process of influence mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. and inspiration. And um, I came across these unbelievably interesting studies on contagion. So when I say contagion, it, it was viral contagion, but mental contagion as opposed to, um, um, you know, the traditional pandemic COVID type virus. You mean ideas that would spread? Yeah, so so yeah. there was some really interesting articles. There was a, a woman who unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago, Sigal Basadi from Yale, who came up with these interesting studies on emotional um, contagion. Yeah. It was, it's, it's under the study called Team Dynamics, how, how one person through their emotions can impact the emotions of others in a group. So like you said, a negative person can bring many people down, a positive person can bring many people up. But they originally thought that, that emotional contagion could only take place in a, in a group situation, in a, in a physical situation. Mm -hmm. So then Facebook and the National Academy of Sciences did this massive study of about nearly 700,000 people. It's one of the biggest social studies in the history of the world. They actually observed people when they weren't looking. It's typical Facebook, you know, they just went and did the study with the National Academy of Sciences there. And they showed that um, you can create emotional contagion virally through the web, through networks, whether it's mm -hmm. Facebook, they did the study on Facebook, but whether it's Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, LinkedIn, we have the power through our keystrokes and the words, the words that we use. So the words conduct the emotions. Mm -hmm. So our words are unbelievably important. So our they words matter. Have, they matter so we, much how we express words, ourselves. These words yeah. have got incredible power because they study positive and negative words and their impact mm -hmm. on emotions. So our words are our power, but our words are our choice. Mm -hmm. So your words. It's a fundamental choice. Are you kind mm -hmm. or are you unkind? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when we sit in front of a keypad and you're typing stuff out, it's a good way and you're going to answer something. Is it kind or is it unkind? Yeah. What's going to be my choice about how I put my spirit out into the, mm -hmm. into the universe? And then I came across another study, which I think is one of the most important studies on behavior, and it's had no, very, very little publicity. So 2.4 million Americans die every year. That's the death rate in the United States. And people die from a number of different things, but the most deaths are caused by consumption. C cigarettes, mm -hmm. bad diets, alcohol, and then you've got, you know, traffic accidents, homicide, illicit drug suicide. But 
bad consumption decisions are that, that lead to cancer obesity are, 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 are a very big killer. So now you have a million Americans dying from preventable deaths through bad choices. Okay, so I'm going like, well, how can we motivate better choices? How can we have a better, more positive mindset? Mm -hmm. And I'm going that there's many interventions that are incredibly successful. But I'm, but I'm saying this little intervention of mine, you know, my son was in that statistic. My son's death was a pre completely preventable death. Uh, kids playing risky games. So I'm going, well, imagine if you can find a little intervention that gives feeling of people, gives people a feeling of power and not powerlessness, not that they're being swept along by this giant riptide or by this giant wave, but they're power. They've got power to make their decisions. They've got power to redefine their lives. They've got power to take a positive path. So this is why I'm on this mission that I am, because I feel that, yes, there's many amazing interventions around the world that have been scientifically proven, but I'm saying, okay, my intervention, it's simple. It's open source code, mm -hmm. and it creates support within the context of that trial. Use it, try it. It'll take you 15 to 20 minutes. You can set up your trial, do it. It's free. It's mm -hmm. open source code, 12 lines. Every line begins with our will. And I've seen it help people. I mean, we did this little academic study. I lost 50 pounds as a result of the code. I have a better relationship with my eight-year-old son. The code is freaking incredible. The code is like my North Star. So there are all these positives from, from the hundreds of thousands or millions of people that have been exposed to this, this simple, pure uh, spiritual method of positive engagement. Mm -hmm. I think yeah, prevention is really important, but intervention really works as well. And I can talk about my my personal experience now. It wasn't the code. I, I had my own codes perhaps there, but I made a decision. It's like, I don't want to continue with this because I was obese at the time. I was suffering from sleep apnea and uh, high blood pressure. And I decided, no, I, and based again for on my son's birthday, I made a decision about five years ago. It's like, I'm going to do something. I'm not going to continue this path. And what, what happened is now my, my blood pressure is under control. I do not need a mask to sleep at night. I will have blood tests soon so we can find out if my diabetes is under control, but I'm pretty sure it is. And I've lost 50 pounds. So yeah. it's, it's, it's that kind of like, yes, it's, it's, it's a will. I will do this. And it's the will, both senses, the future as well as the will, the intention, but really meaning it. Because I find a lot of people say, yeah, I will quit smoking. And they don't. Because uh, deep down, they don't want to. They don't want to quit it, right? But it's like that kind of uh, commitment with oneself. Like, I am going to do this. And that, for me, that was the breaking point. It's like, if I continue with this, it will be horrible. And it will be death, pretty much. Uh, various uh, complications and so on. But no. I'm going to take a different path. And uh, I surprised my uh, my physician, too. She was like, how did you do this? Because she was giving me these drugs, which I, I said, no, that's not that's not dealing with the problem. That's deeper. That's just dealing with the symptoms. And I, that's I'm not interested in that. I want to get to the root of the problem. And so I want to give everyone hope that intervention is quite possible, but it does take effort. It is hard work. It's not just yeah. taking a pill and it's going to be done. It's going to be painful. It's going to be very painful at times, but it's so worth it. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. You know, you know a lot of the scientists write about willpower as a form of self-regulation. Mm -hmm. And yes, it is, but they don't write about hope. They yeah. don't write, write about how powerful it is to have this sense of hope. And, you know, when you read Viktor Frankl and you read Man's yeah. Search for Meaning, the yeah. difference between life and death in Auschwitz yeah. was hope. The yeah. people that had hope, climbed into their bed, they had a cigarette, and they just gave up and, and mm -hmm. died. Mm -hmm. and, and the people with hope, the people with purpose, um, are the people that survive and, and are the people that have the power to make a fundamental mm -hmm. life-changing decision. Mm -hmm. You know, I like to give up smoking um, and um, like to give up drugs or alcohol or, or, or whatever that is. Yes, you can, you've got to have the group around you. You've got to have that support and that engagement 
to help you know reinforce this decision but ultimately it's a personal decision and i know that my intervention can give just give you that little extra bit of power mm -hmm. yes there's many 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 interventions out there but i always say to people just try it man. Try. Mm -hmm. watch it go yeah. 12 nights every night begin with oh well i've carried mine around my wallet with me for 20 years since i read it and, uh -huh. and it gives me you know it gives me a lot of nice very good a lot of uh comfort to know that if things go sideways i pull my and i read my own words they're not nelson mm -hmm. the other words or they're not bill clinton's words or they're not uh, obama's words or uh -huh. yeah or they, they're not uh, uh swami's words in my word i'll never yeah. turn my back on the ocean i will always paddle back out exactly it's it's not an agenda or it's not like you know religion tell me to do that. i mean we can identify with those of course but it's really your own code and i i really like that personal personalized code that uh, you would resonate with and it's like i'm gonna stick with this and this is my path yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah so um yeah um, it's it's quite amazing because too with like my idea of of surfers uh is quite different and yeah you, you are embodying here both the athlete as well as a very intelligent person. And we don't usually, and that's again, probably my failing, assume that athletes would be also very intelligent. You have a de degree in, in leadership as well. And uh, just everything you're saying is, is, is so profound. So I, 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 I am really amazed by that. And it's, it's not the impression we would have, you know, generally. And I, I, I'm, I, I'm wrong probably about this. What do you think? <laughs> Yeah, and I, th I think there, there, there has sort of been a bit of an unfair stereotype around uh, yeah. a lot of athletes. But, you know, I have I have a lot of uh, friends who are athletes in different sports, and they are so, some of them are so spiritually connected because to become the best in any form of, of athletics, you have to have that sort of elevated level of spiritual consciousness, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, when I, when I would, my specialty in surfing was riding inside the tube, which is that spinning tunnel of water. It's like riding inside a water with cycling. Uh, it's the most exciting, exhilarating aspect of surfing and the most artful. And I developed a whole new technique of actually riding inside the tube. Whereas before people were, it was like you shoot an arrow and you shoot an arrow through the tube and people would just go fast and straight. And I developed this maneuvering system to to just change the direction, change speed. Uh, so it was just a way to sort of, in, in some ways, prolong the experience. But when I was inside the tube, and it's incredibly intense in there, and it's dark, and sometimes the pressure builds up, and then it shoots you out, like you've been shot out of a cannon, this mm -hmm. water pressure builds up. And, and for that brief moment, you're flying above the surface of the water. It's an incredible sensation. But there's no sensation of sound because you're in this absolute uh, place of stillness and concentration, even though you're, you're going along at, at maximum speed and you're in the maximum danger zone because if you wipe out, this wave will smash you over into the sharp shallow coral. And, and when I was in that moment, you know, psychologist, I know I've met the guy who developed the theory, Miha sent Miha, the theory of yeah, flow. flow yeah. you know, when you're inside that tube, I, I used to say, man, time is expanded inside the tube. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there were moments when I felt that I could curve that wall to my will. Yeah, I I you, you probably curve. do, actually. You yeah, probably do, of, I believe that. <laughs> absolute master of myself and the situation. Mm -hmm, it was just mm -hmm. a wonderful feeling to have. So a lot of surface experiences, perhaps uh, some of them can't, articulated but, but we do have these almost like extrasensory uh, mm -hmm. and that's one thing i envy uh, with with athletes any kind of athletes because they they are in the zone they are in the flow and in that moment uh it's it's just like anything is possible but the problem is often after the event they just step out and live their lives in, in, in an ordinary state of consciousness for me i would like to have that throughout my life as much as possible of being like that because then it, it's so wonderful and you forget yourself you just like really in that moment i think the closest i get is podcasting because i feel like this intense pressure and then as, yeah. as well like channeling it and all these thoughts that come to my mind and i think it's wonderful but again if we can expand it 
and just apply it to our relationships, apply it to our jobs, apply it to every aspect of our lives. I think that would be a great thing. So, so one of the lines in, in the service code that I wrote so many years ago is, I will catch a wave every day, even in my mind. Mm -hmm. So this whole notion, this metaphor of mind surfing, uh, really, I think, based on what you're saying, that you know we want to bring this feeling into our work life, into our family life, and and certainly there are times when I, I can't get away, I can't go surfing, and I'm in front of my uh, my computer. But you know, you just shut your eyes and you just imagine <laughs> riding inside that tube, or you can imagine being on that wave, and it certainly does. You know, it uplifts you, yeah. it takes you to another place. It it gives you that calmness. Um, and, and you can almost get in that feeling of flow just by mm -hmm, mm -hmm. re-experiencing. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also a matter of mindset too, of like having the confidence, like I can handle this. I can handle the next wave, no matter how big it is. If it's bigger, it's a challenge, but I can do this. And uh, before in the past, I would just be afraid of, of any, any kind of change that could happen. I'd worry about it too. But now it's like, okay, well, what you got? Let's see what I can do. And I'm sure I can handle this sooner or later. It will take time. But I think that's really important. So it doesn't bring us down. And we face it as a challenge. It's like, I did not expect this bigger wave. But here we go, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, around right about, uh, I'll take the drop with commitment. Mm -hmm. So that is to actually break, break through that fear barrier just by committing absolutely to pushing forward over the edge mm -hmm. over the most dangerous part of the way which is the takeoff and then also you know we're going to wipe out there's no surf in the world that has ever become successful without wiping out thousands and thousands of times and mm -hmm. that notion of i will always paddle back out mm -hmm. so no matter what um you know, I'm conditioned that no matter what, I'll always paddle back out. So I'll always paddle back out. It's about perseverance and resilience. But mm -hmm. It's also about hope because mm -hmm. only by paddling back out can you catch your next wave. So, so like I say, that you know, surfing is a wonderful metaphor, and I'm just so lucky that you know I've had these incredible surfing experiences that I've been able to translate um, through metaphor mm -hmm. and and through my perspective. You know, show people a window and show people a mirror on 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 what I've done and what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for such an awesome discussion. I'm gonna the the book again is the Surfer and the Sage. You are both. I can tell the surfer and the sage, a guide to survive and ride life's waves. I love your idea of the code. I, I wholeheartedly, uh, um, um, people should follow that because I think it will uh, bring out the, their authentic self. They can connect more with it and it becomes more explicit. So I, I, I highly applaud that. Thank you so much for everything you're doing. And it's just been wonderful to have you on my show. Arash, thanks for the interest. Thanks for the interesting and penetrating questions oh, thank you and thanks for your uh, soulful spiritual way and i can see you when you want to make a difference you want to you know get good perspectives and good messages out into the community so i really appreciate what you're doing and thanks for having me on and uh -huh. next thank time we're going to have noah then Shia on i'm sure you and him would uh, i would love i would love to talk to him yes thanks so much take care